Welcome back to the second annual Nat King Cole Generation Hope Educators Conference. Our final clinician today is Ms. Essie Nadal. Essie Nadal is an active educator and performer in the South Florida area. She is currently the orchestra director at the Conservatory School at North Palm Beach in Palm Beach, Florida. Ms. Nadal has served on the cello faculty of the South Florida Symphony Orchestra, Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp, Preparatory School of Music at Lynn University and the Schwab School of Music Preparatory Division in Columbus, Georgia. Ms. Nadal holds a Master's of Music and Cello Performance from Shenandoah University, a, performance prof a Professional Performance Certificate from Lynn University Conservatory of Music, and a Master's of Music Education from the University of Miami, where she was a teaching assistant for the Donna E. Shalala Music Reach Program. Ms. Nadal is an alumni of the Brevard Music Center and a registered Suzuki teacher. Speaking on modulation, how can we develop universal orchestra programs in our communities? Please welcome Ms. Essie Nadal. Good afternoon, Essie. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Mr. Rhodes, for having me here. We're glad to have you. I am so excited. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And I want to thank the Nat King Cole Generation Hope for the invitation. It's such a great topic to be presenting on and to be speaking on. And I love that I was uh, just listening to Dr. Cox's presentation because a lot of the things we're going to talk about today really intersect. Um, I was hoping and I'm still hoping that this can be a conversation among us and amongst colleagues because these are just my ideas. And I think that um, when we all talk together and we have a conversation about these topics, we really enrich our field. So let me present. Here we go. Our screen. Is it showing, Mr. Rhodes? We don't see the shared screen as of yet. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. All right, so our topic today is modulation and how can we develop universal orchestra programs in our communities? First, I wanted to start off by just asking the question, what do we mean by universal? Um, this has different definitions and it's gonna change according to what a field we're talking about and what our context is. So um, we can say that universal includes or covers all of, or a whole collectively or distributely without any limit or exception. It's also available equitable to all of the members of a society. I really like, um, I really like us to focus on the term equitable. And it's adapted or adjustable to meet varied requirements. So for us, orchestra teachers, I really think we have some considerations we need to focus on. Students with special needs, the gender identity of our students, the race of our students, and the socioeconomic status of our students. And for today's purposes, I'll be focusing more on gender identity and race. Um, one thing I did not share is I am from the Dominican Republic. I am born, I was born and raised in the Dominican Republic. And I came to the US um, for college and it kind of gave me an interesting perspective about being um, raised in a place where I was part of the majority always. I was an orchestra player in the majority. And I, I came to the US then, and I was all of a sudden part of a minority. So diversity in our orchestra programs, it's um, equal strength, really. The more diverse our programs are, the stronger they are. The more representation we're going to have, the more ideas we're going to have. So these are some questions that I think we need to ponder as orchestra directors. Um, 
and orchestra teachers. How is diversity represented in our programs? So right now we're talking about just how diverse is your orchestra? Do you have um, the do you have the the availability to make it diverse? Some uh, programs are not diverse at all, and that might be because you're not in a diverse community. But how? Um, just kind of take a look at your program and see how diverse it is. What are we doing to make our program accessible to all? That's a big, big question, because at the end of the day, we are the ones that can make it. Nobody's going to come and do it for us. We have to do it. Are we unintentionally promoting one instrument over the other based on students' gender identity, on their race, on their socioeconomic status, or on special needs? And are we recruiting students based on Eurocentric ideas of good behavior? Right, so Eurocentric, focusing on the European culture um, or its history and excluding the wider view of the world. I think we as orchestra directors, a lot of times, um, all music directors want to have the good kids and what looks good in, what culture, in one culture may not be just good across the board. So I have a brief um, history and overview of race and gender representation in American orchestras. And I thought we would start with that because it really matters. It matters, it comes from the top, what has happened in American orchestras in that tradition and going from the top down, how does that impact our programs today, our K-12 education especially, right? So um, in the top right corner, I have Henry J. Lewis. And Henry J. Lewis was the first African-American in a major symphony orchestra, which was the LA Philharmonic. And he joined the orchestra in 1948. Um, he was also the first African-American conductor in the Seventh Army Symphony Orchestra. And um, he conducted that in 1955. Then in the bottom right here, we have Patricia Pratis Jennings which was the first African-American woman hired as a principal player in a major American orchestra, the Pittsburgh Symphony, as a principal keyboard player, right? So first principal player, first female African-American principal player of a major symphony. And that happened in 1966. Um, for me, what's important to note about this fact is the dates, right? So 1948, 1966. And noting that the New York Philharmonic was founded in 1842. So that's a gap of 100 years where we didn't have any African-American representation in symphony orchestras. Okay, So let's just think about, about it for a second. How does that impact our K-12 orchestra programs today? The next slide is um, basically gender representation, which really ties into what Dr. Cox was talking about earlier. So um, in the top right, cor right corner, we have Marion Alsop, first female conductor of a major American orchestra, which was the Baltimore Symphony, in 2007. That is just, it's just yesterday, 2007. Um, in the bottom, we have Alondra de la Parra. She's a Mexican conductor, and she was the first ever music director of the Queensland symphony orchestra in Australia. So the higher up the chain we go in, orchest in orchestras, then the, the more disparity we have between women and men. It's um, in the orchestra itself as musicians, it's about 50-50. We have about 50% representation of female in the orchestra as players, musicians, um, against the male counterpart, but the higher up you go, so if you are a woman conducting a symphony orchestra and then at the, the, the latest one would be a music director, then the wider the gap. Uh, that is a huge disparity in women as music directors. Um, women conductors are twice as likely to be found in other conductor positions. So 20% um, more likely to be found in music director roles. This is a quote that I really um, like by Alondra de la Parra. 
She said, we bring to the podium everything that one is. One can only be who one is and nothing else. It's the experiences of your life that you share with others. I am a woman, I am a Mexican, but that is just part of the many ingredients that make me who I am. It's more three-dimensional than the particular labels. So that is important for me because how many times if you are maybe the only one, the only person of color, the only female in a group, you feel you have felt singled out or you have felt that, you know, you contribute to the ensemble because you are a woman or because you are a person of color, right? And so how many times do we put that in our students? How many times do we make a kid feel that way? So again, what we are is more, especially us as musicians, we tend to think more globally that, um, yeah, you, like she said, she's a woman, she's a Mexican, but um, she really has a lot more labels, a lot more to her than just the labels. So next slide, I wanna present a little bit of a report by the League of American Orchestras. This research um, was made in, 20, in 2016. And it's a report on racial, ethnic, and gender diversity in the orchestra field. Over a span of 34 years, the proportion of musicians from African-American, Hispanic, Asian, American Indian, basically non-white backgrounds, has increased four, fourfold, from 3.4% to 14% in orchestras, but nonetheless, that's less than 15%. Also, it's really important to note that the increase has been driven largely by an increase in musicians from Asian and Pacific Islander backgrounds, okay? So it's not just all minorities get a representation. Sometimes this data, this data is just clumped together. Um, as white and non-white. So the proportion of non-white musicians represented in the orchestra workforce remains extremely low. The wider orchestra field, such as conductors, executives, uh, staff, and more and board members, that also really remains very low and just um, majority white. And that's just more information. Um, really, in this study, they um, they noted the differences between the larger orchestras and the smaller orchestras. So the percentage of musicians from African American and Hispanic or Latino backgrounds employed by smaller orchestras is double the percentage of those employed by larger orchestras. More on the report. Um, this is um, this has to do with orchestra staff, right? So um, the League of American Orchestras started collecting data in 2010. And since then, the percentage of non-white staff has hovered around 14%. So again, just very low, very low representation. It demonstrates that the racial and ethnic profile of executives, such as um, executive directors, CEOs, presidents, is overwhelmingly white. Um, after looking at this data, we really just question and we just wonder, um, why do these disparities exist? Is it that you know there's less interest in um, no, non-white musicians to become orchestra staff or orchestra members? And we know that's not, the, um, that's not the true and that's not the answer, right? It's just, it's very hard to break into a field that's not dom dominated by a single race. So how do these practices impact our orchestra programs, our school programs? Do they have an impact? And that's kind of the question I wanted to um, dive in today. This next slide, um, I kind of can't believe that I'm presenting it, but it did happen. It happened in January 2021 at the TMEA um, convention. This was a controversy presentation. Um, there's a lot of controversy around this presentation. 
Um, it was called Building Better Bassoons. I believe they presented this and it was really just taken down pretty quickly over all the controversy around it. So the presentation was called Building Better Bassoons and that can apply to us as well, right? It can be building better violins or cellists or just orchestra players. And this presenter, um, he wanted to just answer the question of how you choose the right students for your bassoon studio. And he spoke of intangible characteristics that the best bassoon students must have or a potential bassoon student must possess before you even think about accepting them or investing in them. Some of them you can see in the picture are self-motivation, intelligence, socioeconomic status, pre-packaged musical knowledge, and a stable home. So let's um, unpack this. He had self-motivation, right? Choose students who thrive on their own. Um, whatever that means, that is just such a vague um, term. It can mean something different for different people. Intelligence. Find smart kids, strong in math and reading comprehension. Um, how many times, I don't know if you guys have, uh, have had the experience, I definitely have, where kids come into our program, into our orchestra program, and their scores, their math scores are low. And after a couple of years of being in the orchestra program, their scores really shoot up. Socioeconomic status. Never prohibited, but should be taken into account when regarding the expense of reads and lessons. The same for us, right? Like we're always thinking if this kid is going to take lessons, if they can afford it, um, if they can afford to rehear their bow on a regular basis, Rossin, a practice mute. Okay, next he had musical knowledge. Understanding note reading, bass clef, and rhythms gives more time to focus on the bassoon. So he was kind of looking for kids who could already um, understand music and read music, right? Before you even took them on. And then uh, lastly, the most, the more uh, controversial one for me was the stable home. He said that every bassoon kid is an investment. Are they going to remain within your community? Questions to answer. Do they live in an apartment or house? Are they buying or renting? Do they move often? Are their parents transferred for work often? Are lessons a possibility both from a financial perspective and a mobility perspective? And is the home open to home practice? Um, yeah, if, I, if somebody would have applied this metric to me, then I wouldn't be here today. And that's an important question. I think we always have to have that in the, just, um, just in the back of our, of our minds, um, thinking about sometimes we see a kid and they come to us and um, you think that maybe they didn't practice. Why didn't they practice or they're not doing as good as they can or as well as they can? Is it because they don't have a, or they don't live in a stable home? What does that even mean? We really don't know and we can't make assumptions. The next one is an example, again, talking about just stereotypes um, coming from the top down. This is an example of a collegiate music education. This unfortunately happened at the Juilliard School this summer. It was a master class with Pisha uh, Zuckerman. So one of the classical music's biggest names has apologized after using offensive cultural stereotypes towards two young musicians during a Juilliard school masterclass. Um, this was, it was all over the news because it was so big, right? So um, these two sisters were playing, they were of Asian descent, and somewhere along the masterclass, he started asking them or just telling them, sometimes if you have a question about how to play it, just sing it. And then he went on to say, in Korea, they don't sing. And he went on talking about how there's no singing in Korea. So one of the sisters finally spoke up and she said, I'm not Korean. And he kind of asked, then where are you from? Right? So first of all, he's assuming just because um, they, they look Asian, they have Asian, uh, an Asian background, he assumed that they were from Korea. 
So the sister began to explain that she was from, uh, she was of half Japanese descent. And then he interrupted and he said, in Japan, they don't sing either. Then he uh, mimicked a sing-song vocal style that has been stereotyped as Asian. And he said, this is not singing, violin is not a machine. At this point, the smile had uh, melted from the sister's face. Towards the end of the masterclass, Zuckerman reportedly returned to the topic saying, in Korea, they don't sing, it's not in their DNA. So this comes from the top. This happened at Julia this summer. We can definitely expect this happening in our K-12 music programs across the country. So our theme today and our question, how can we affect change in our orchestra programs? We as orchestra directors, right? Um, this is from the League of American Orchestras. This was from this, their statement on racial discrimination, June 2020. He said, all orchestras, each in and within their own communities, must discover their unique paths to greater inclusion and equity, which will allow them to better see, understand, and engage all of their diverse stakeholders. I think that music educators, we have the power to create inclusive environments for our students, and we can serve as effective agents of change. We just gotta know how to do it. So we have a couple of um, action steps for the orchestra classroom. Instrument demonstrations, guest artists, musical genres, and repertoire. These are things that I try uh, with my students. I really try to do the, this as much as I can. Some of them are hard, but it's a learning path. It's a process. And I just wanted to share that with you guys today. So instrument demonstration, right? Representation matters. Um, when we're showing instruments or when the kids are choosing to play what instruments they wanna play, we can showcase musician, musicians of colors. We can also showcase female musicians. And um, really importantly with female musicians, you wanna showcase them in a way of, um, sometimes kids don't think that women should be playing the double bass or um, so most of the time it's the parents, right? They think, well, the double bass is too big of an instrument. Even the cello is too big of an instrument, right? So you want to kind of break that stereotype and it really works if you're showcasing these um, musicians of colors and female musicians when you do instrument demonstrations. So these are some of the things that I use. This is so powerful. This was so powerful for my students because it's a family. This is the kind of medicine um, from England. And I get to talk to them about how the cellist, um, Sheku was the first, the youngest cellist to play in the BBC, um, the BBC concert in London. They're always just so overwhelmed by that. 
and you get to see the whole family playing music together and it's a black family how many times do we see that how often do we really see that our kids get to see that um next i like i like to showcase this video this is lauren pierce in bass <laughs> So that's just an idea. So the kids go, whoa, I don't have to be a boy to play the double bass, right? Like I can still play it if I'm a girl. Keep going. Okay. So the next one that I have is reach out to musicians from diverse backgrounds in our community and ask them to perform for our students. These are guest artists. Um, we're lucky here to have a lot of guest artists come by our school and we really try them to be from diverse um, backgrounds. If you don't have that luxury, if you don't have somebody that you can find in your community, then you can play a recorded performance by such a group in your class. So these are the string queens actually at the Kennedy Center. Okay, we can move on. And what a great example of like musicians just having fun, um, stream musicians having fun doing their thing. That's something that the kids always like to see. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Uh, the next one that I have is diverse musical genres, right? Because sometimes our kids, how are they supposed to know that they can also play jazz, that they can play hip hop, that they can play so many other things, not just pure classical music with our instruments, even though they need to know how to play, um, how to learn how to play the instrument. I like showing this clip by Spencer Spalding. Um, this has been really uh, powerful and it has made an impact on a lot of my bass players, my uh, bass girls. As virtuoso Esperanza Spalding. Well, Europe gave us classical music, and jazz is America's classical music. Where blues was born in the farms and fields of the South, jazz is urban cool. So I'm going to sing a song for you that uh, has been sung for more than six decades. And it has a message for hope. Originally, this was sung during the Great Depression when the end was not in sight. So I hope you enjoy, and I hope you try living on the sunny side of the street. I used to walk in the shade with my blues on parade. But I'm not afraid. Okay, 
All right, that's that. And then lastly, one of my favorites, because they are from South Florida, is Black Violin. played an arrangement of this piece with my um, sixth grade orchestra kids, they loved it. I didn't even have to um, insist on practices because they would show up really early in the morning to my classroom just to practice this piece because they thought it was just the coolest thing ever. As virtuoso, Esperanza Spalding. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, repertoire. So this is such a broad topic because Really, in America, we draw a lot from um, the European classical music. And this, um, I was reading this article called Why is American Classical Music So White? And this is a quote that I found very interesting. Had the vernacular of slave songs, spirituals, and jazz taken root in our classical music, we would have a very different landscape today and a classical sound that is uniquely American. We, um, unfortunately, don't have that in American classical music. So Dvorak made a radical prediction in 1893. He told the New York Herald that the future of this country must be founded upon what he called the Negro melodies. This must be the real foundation of any serious and original school of composition to be developed in the United States. Sadly, that did not happen, right? But it kind of begs the question of like, what do we do in our programs? Is all the repertoire that we're playing um, is it all from the European classical tradition? And most of the time it is. Um, this is the Negro Folk Symphony written by William Dawson in 1934, a work that is just underperformed. It's really not even a part of the symphony standard at all. And for the sake of time, I'm going to keep going, but if you can just um, find this on YouTube, it's a really um, just transformative work to listen to, beautiful, beautiful piece. To the next one. So I have some repertoire resources here, and I'm happy. I know this presentation is going to be available, but I'm happy to share this with you as well. And it's music by blackcomposers.org. Um, that is a project by Rachel Barton Pine, violinist, and she has a lot of good resources for young students, um, of uh, especially violin students, but also all the strings. We have composerdiversity.com, um, latinorchestralmusic.com, and African Diaspora Music Project.org. So these are places where we can go to find what we need for our classroom. Now, some more practical stuff. This comes from NAFME. It's an article in NAFME uh, published in 2017. Uh, it's called Embracing Human Difference in music education and suggestion for honoring diversity in music classrooms. Becoming a more inclusive educator by recognizing, honoring, and valuing student identities will likely require change and change can be uncomfortable. We need to overcome concerns about saying or doing the wrong thing and approach this change with humility, open minds, open hearts, and open ears. Every person can learn and grow in and through music and therefore has the right to see their ideas, values, and identities reflected in music education. We don't have all the answers. If we would, we wouldn't be here. Um, but it's just important to keep questioning and um, keep reading, keep informing ourselves, keep um, going to workshops, right? And be humble when we do it, because we don't have every answer, all the answers, all of our experiences are different, and you can't ever that you are done or that you understand it or that you got it. 
So some of the recommendations that I find useful for us in orchestra is knowing your students as individuals. So allow your students to self-identify in terms of race, gender, ethnicity, religion, disability, sexual orientation, etc. Um, one example that I had in my program, in my school program, we had a girl who identified as a boy and she did not, she told us right from the beginning that she wanted to wear the boy's uniform that was at the time, just the pants and the white shirt. We, of course, said yes right away and it wasn't even an issue. And the second one, some students may feel comfortable speaking about their experiences and individual identities while others may be more reserved. Use student preferred music. To understand musical preferences, use an assignment such as a playlist of my life, make time for open discussion in class, and listen attentively. And that works. I have done that because you also give the students ownership over what they want to play in a concert. Two is foster participation that reflects your school community. Um, explore gender equity in ensembles, right? Examine whether the proportion of students with IEPs reflects the proportion of students with IEPs in your school. I mean, in your program, right? Does that reflect the proportion of students with IEPs in your school? That's important too, being inclusive of that. And offering entry points to music education for all students at all levels. Number three, ensure repertoire and materials to reflect your learners. Select music from cultures represented in and beyond your school community. Ensure materials use gender inclusive language, they versus he and she. Choose music written by composers who represent a variety of genders, ethnicities, races, sexual orientations, social classes, etc. We have a lot of work to do in the orchestra field because that is not easy. What's easy and accessible to us is usually works by uh, white males. And that's just, that's how it is. That's what it is and is upon us to make that change, to be actively looking for um, other composers that we can represent. Structure classroom practices and policies to create an inclusive learning environment. So, Again, going back to that idea of are we just selecting the kids that have good behavior based on what we think good behavior is. Um, so establish classroom discipline policies that do not disproportionately affect certain groups. Again, you have to know your community. You have to know your students. Protect your students from harassment and discrimination based on race, ethnicity, religion, home language, disability, gender, gender expression and or sexual orientation and understand how the cost of materials such as instruments uniforms may affect students who come from low-income families a lot of the times um, we can be oblivious to that as music directors and again it's about understanding and knowing your students and your community and offering ways for them to be um, Often ways for these things to be accessible to them so that they can be successful. So it's just as simple as having always extra rosin in your classroom and then um, offering, to, offering it to the kids, to all of the kids, so that the one kid that doesn't have the rosin doesn't feel like they're being singled out. Um, this uh, next slide comes from also the League of American Orchestras. These are eight ways to combat anti-Black racism. Center the people who are being harmed to understand and work from their perspective. So not yours, but their perspective, right? Learn the history of systematic discrimination to be able to empathize with black people. Grow your awareness of words, behaviors, assumptions, and processes that communicate racist beliefs of superiority or inferiority. Stay open to new perspective, perspectives on the familiar to remain vulnerable and tolerant. Find your own way to stand up against racism in your life, in your community, your organization, in our country. Be an ally, increase the number of allies and support them. Embrace discomfort and demonstrate a deep unwavering commitment to the goals of equity and inclusion. Um, if you're doing it right, it's gonna be uncomfortable. That's what I found. 
and develop mechanisms to keep yourself accountable, educated, and sensitive to the journey of others. Um, this comes from the same report, and I just wanted you guys to see like the huge disparity, right, in hiring musicians uh, in the audition system within American orchestra. So black musicians were not permitted to auditions for over a hundred years, and we saw that with Henry J. Lewis being the first um, African American musician in a major American orchestra. So the opportunities to be heard had to come from bold advocates, people in power like George Steele, Leonard Rose. Sokolsky. Um, racial discrimination and nepotism limited access to audition notices and, apprent and apprenticeships, playing opportunities. If you didn't know it was happening, how could you even show up and be a part of it? One had to be a union member to be hired, and in the late 19th century, early uh, 20th century, the unions were only for white people. They were still segregated, and they use um, they offer unequal access to audition notices, opportunities, and representation. Okay, and I'd like to finish with this statement uh, from the League of American Orchestras. They released a statement on racial discrimination last summer, June of 2020. And um, number one, I think it's important to acknowledge that they acknowledge the racism, right? that has permeated through their organization and through the orchestra um, community at large. So they said, the League of American Orchestras acknowledges, accepts responsibility for, and apologizes for the role it has played in perpetuating, excusing, and participating in systematic discrimination based on race within the orchestra field. The most important one for me is this statement, because this really, um, comes down to what we do in the classroom. So the impacts of our actions have included the loss of valuable musical and other creative contributions by generations of black people, the disenfranchisement of fellow Americans and redirected career trajectories, all resulting in fewer people engaging with the musical culture we all share and love. This ultimately diminishes the vibrancy of the art form and therefore undermines the orchestral experience for everyone. Again, remembering that diversity in our programs equals strength. So here's some references, and this is all I have for you today. This is my contact information. I would love to hear from you. And again, just keeping the conversation open and bouncing off ideas of each other. I think it's really important. Thank you so much, Essie. Uh, you know, please, free, uh, friends, please feel free to ask questions. Um, through my chat box and I'll try to get as many as possible. We have some coming in right here. One is for you would be, how can we get more multicultural music in band and orchestra? I usually find music that reflects heritage of my students' parents, um, then they become more involved in their child's music education. I know you gave a link about um, the resources, but again, how can we get more multicultural music uh, in, in, the, in the classroom? Right, I even find that doing arrangements of songs that we know is very powerful. For example, for our students coming into um, third grade who are new to the orchestra program, when they choose an instrument, um, this year was different because of coronavirus and the pandemic and everything else, but I played a lot of videos for them and every time they hear anything by Bob Marley, a lot of my Jamaican students just right away went like, whoa, I know that song, right? My mommy plays that, my, my daddy listens to that at home. And they wanted to just connect to that instrument right away. They go, wait, you can play that in the cello, you can play that in the violin. So even doing arrangements of the songs, um, if it's for the younger kids, that works a lot. For the older kids, like in, um, you know, once you're playing orchestra, maybe middle school and high school, you really have to go to the sources where you're going to find the repertoire because it is difficult. Right, right. And, and a question for you, because I know you felt this firsthand. Uh, you know, we live in, in, a, in a melting pot. We have students come from so many different cultures. What was your experience coming from the Dominican Republic to the States? Uh, what was one one or two big things you had to just adapt or acclimate yourself to from a musical standpoint um, coming from, from another country, you know, what, what was that like? Or can you think about what our, our students school starting like next week from some school districts, 
What are some things you would suggest be mindful of as that student is coming from maybe from another culture, another country? Yeah, I would say obviously we know language is a big barrier. And um, even when you think or you know that your student is fluent in English, again, it's a different culture. Um, students coming from other countries may not be as open to just speak the language and freely. And sometimes we think, well, this kid just doesn't speak or, you know, it's not smart enough or doesn't want to share or is not confident enough. It is a big deal. It's a big deal. Um, I think also for little kids, especially when they hear and they hear themselves speak that they have an accent. That was a big deal for me. It still is, you know, especially more when I came over and I was 18, 19 years old. Um, that's difficult and it kind of impairs your your ability to perform also because you're very just you're very self-conscious. So we have to be aware of that and just be empathetic with our students. Great, that's great, great, thank you. Um, we have another question that came in. Um, how can string teachers include more jazz music for their students? Um, we know that sometimes most of the student um, literature curriculum um, do not include any jazz. So any suggestions um, towards that jazz angle? Oh yeah, um, well, we listen to a lot of it in my classroom, I think a lot of it starts with listening. So the kids just get an idea of like what it is. You can have like a listening period. I like listening to music in general, right? So sometimes we're not always just playing, um, but we listen, we listen to good performances. And then I find pieces. I did a couple of years ago, I did this jingle jazz piece for our um, winter concert. It's not a Christmas concert, it's a winter concert, but I was still able to get away with it. And it was a jingle jazz. Um, they loved that they didn't know, a lot of them didn't know what jazz was or if they knew they don't know how to perform it. So I just got help from my colleagues. You know, I went to my band director who's also a jazz director um, and I had him come in and work with my kids and say, hey, how do you, how do you teach this? How do you play this? What's the style here? And they got to see that it was really eye-opening for them. It's a great experience. Wow, cool, great. And, and another question that came through earlier, you know, we, we have some school districts that, you know, put a little emphasis on the hiring process of music teachers, but what can we do to show um, teachers or principals that we could provide um, strong social, emotional, and intellectual advancement through orchestra or through music. I know you have a, a, a fearless leader who is a, a arts advocate, but not everyone has that that blessing of luxury, you know, but how can, you know, we show our principles, you know, this is a well needed um, part of the pro I mean, part of the curriculum and not just being a baby sitting, sitting service. <laughs> right. Well, the resource is there, and I think it's just a matter of um, doing the work of finding it and presenting it to our administrators in a meaningful way. A lot of the times, they don't want to just hear, um, well, I can get my kids to get to a superior in a, on an MPA. They don't know what it is. You know, they don't care. It took a lot. Even though my principal is a big um, arts advocate, even at my school, it took a lot for my administration to understand that performance assessments are a thing. They're important. You know, they have inherent value for the kids. So you kind of have to play the game of going over to the administrator side. Like, what are they looking at for their school? And then find the research that supports um, what we know, that when you invest in arts education in your school, your scores go up. Our, the um, test scores in our school really have gone up consistently every year. And that is just, it's linked to the work that we do in the arts and in, in music. So if you're able to find research that's out there, then do that. I believe it's in NAFMI. Um, also, they published a lot of articles during the pandemic of um, just how to be your own um, self-advocate in your school and presenting that uh, data to your administrators, how um, the music program and the arts in general is really gonna benefit the entire school. Absolutely, you know, um, my dad was a, was a music educator for over 30 years. And one thing he would say to me was, you know, you, in order to remain fresh in, in this activity, you must remain being a student of the game. And when you use the word student, it's because we're forever learning. And I, I really like the resources you get, you provided because, especially when it comes to um, breaking stereotypes, uh, 
using, you know, ident using um, examples where students can identify. I, I found as a band director, I stopped playing professional recordings for my students of, of, of music we wanted to play because they would always say, well, Mr. Rhodes, I can't play like that. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a pro, but it took me to do research to find out resources that were out there that maybe we could play this piece and they can hear a college student, I mean, a college band or another high school band or another middle school band that can play this and say, oh, this, these are the same kids like you. So I really like the um, the videos you shared with us. And and funny, you, you talk about the um, stream queens. Um, I just saw them last month uh, at the Kennedy oh. Center. And if you haven't heard the stream queens play before, I highly encourage it. It's a great resource. They have an album out. And Nichella is, is an elementary music music teacher. I just met her, um, like I said, last month for the first time. So I'm so glad you was able to show resources um, of diversity and, 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 and students that can adapt to saying, hey, that's me. That could be me. So I, I, you know, I think that that's really, really impressive. And, and really, really um, great that you was able to add that to the resources. Yeah, it is important. It is so important. Um, I think representation matters. I think a lot of the time we don't uh, pay attention to it as much as we should, or we, because we're so focused on just our instrument and our craft and what we do that we don't see, okay, well, this little boy is not seeing himself represented in all of these videos that I'm showing or all of these guest artists that I'm bringing in, right? Or maybe when I was growing up, well, only, you know, the Russians or the Asians could play at a really high level. And then we started to see kind of like the field changing, but if you don't bring it to your students, they don't even know. So like, right, they don't even know that you can have uh, that much fun playing your instrument, a string instrument. Like just going back to the example of the string queens, Mm -hmm. They don't even know. They think, well, um, classical music and orchestra music is just Mozart and Beethoven and guys who are just, you know, old or how is that relevant to me? So I think we always have to make it relevant to our students and just really invest in that because it pays off. I agree. And one more question. We have like about three minutes left and I, I have a semi answer for this, but I want your thoughts. Let's go back to the question of jazz. And if, if, if there's no exposure out there, no curriculum for that, would you recommend transcribing some things? Like, for example, this, this question says, should we use like Jamie Abersall, which, which is very heavy jazz um, warm ups for exposing st string students to that? My answer would be, you know, you might want to water that down to Jamie Abersall stuff. But would you recommend any transcribing for, for, for string teachers to pull some, some jazz curriculum in? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I would I think that's the same way you think. I mean, you got to be careful with that because if you do it in a way that is not accessible technically for your students, then it can be counterproductive. Um, I had a really hard time with a jazz class in college because I just thought it would be the most fun thing and maybe like an easy elective to take and just improv. And it was just the toughest class I could ever take. I had to get uh, help outside from class from my teacher because I was, I was failing it, you know? It's a really, really hard thing to do. So I would say first, um, you need to find somebody, you need to find a jazz professional that you can talk to and, um, you know, learn about it first and then see if it works for you in your instrument. Because if it, if it does, and then it can be can be problematic. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, on behalf of Nat King Cole, Generation Hope, we thank you so much, Essie, for sharing your expertise and time today. You were so eloquent and, and so informative. So we definitely want to thank you again for your presentation today. Thank you so much, Mr. Rhodes. And thank you, everybody, for being here and just sharing this moment with us. Awesome. Well, friends, well, that concludes day two of sessions. Uh, I want to thank our presenters, Ms. Julie Duty, Dr. Tiffany Cox, and Ms. Essie Nadal. I also want to thank Nat King Cole Generation Hope and the Cole Twins for the generous contributions to music education. Lastly, I want to thank you, the audience, for taking part in our session today. We appreciate your participation and your engagement. Um, please tune in tomorrow for our final day of our conference starting at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please invite um, more friends and colleagues. It's free, why not just jump in? It's Friday, we can just wrap up a great day with some great um, promising practices amongst our, our colleagues in our field. Um, we have 
we will have two amazing clinicians speaking on equity and access in music education, and we have a special closing guest artist. So I hope you have a great day today, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.